Mmm, goddamn, folks. Sometimes you just feel good about a podcast that's coming up, and that's exactly how I feel today. It's February 26, 2019. You can turn off your CNBC. You can turn off your Bloomberg terminal. You can sit back. You can crack one open. You can spark one up, and you can listen to the QTR podcast. We're going to tell you really what the fuck is actually going on in the financial world. How about that? Let's see if we can't blow your hair back for a minute. Before I do, and before I bring on self-proclaimed, quote-unquote, this is how Guy Adami described himself to me in my five-minute pre-podcast interview phone call I just had with him. I said, Guy, nice to talk to you for the first time. He goes, yeah, I'm just a guinea on TV. (laughs) So I'm going to have Mr. Guy Adami from CNBC on. I can tell from the 30 seconds I just spoke to him, this is going to be a great podcast today. I'm fucking super stoked about it. Let's just go through a little housekeeping real quick, all right? And don't be a dick, all right? Don't fast forward through this part. Listen to what I got to say. One of these days, I'm going to slip some secret code into some buried treasure into the beginning where I list the patrons and all the other stuff that everybody fast forwards to. And only the real listeners, the people that listen to the real shit or are too stoned to get up and find the fast forward button, those are the people that are going to hit it big, folks. First and foremost, this podcast is a recommended to drink minimum. Now, I say recommended, but really that kind of means mandatory, folks. So if you haven't gotten on that, you want to get on that immediately. Now, quote the Raven. Some people send me an email. What do I do? I can't drink. Remember 10 things I hate about you when the guy's like, should you be drinking when you don't have a liver? Or I don't like beer. I like to do this or I like to do that. The answer is, folks, do whatever you got to do to get your rocks off to enjoy this podcast, okay? I don't know what you're into. Maybe you like to tie yourself up and whack yourself in the ass with a hockey stick. Whatever it is, all right, do it and do two of them. Two is the minimum for this podcast. That's number one. Number two, this podcast is sure as hell not investment advice. You want investment advice? Turn on the TV, find somebody with a tie or a bow tie with some kind of name that sounds like they're from Connecticut and listen to what they're doing, all right? Stop in your local Edward Jones branch. Talk to the very interesting people you'll find in there. I'm sure it'll be riveting. Do your research elsewhere. If you're listening to this podcast for your financial research, you deserve to wind up in the gutter, in a dumpster, in rehab. Folks, it's not going to be good, okay? So just don't listen to this for for financial advice at all. That's number two. Number three, and honestly, to me, the most important piece of information up front, this podcast is brought to you by my patrons patrons are people that sign up on patreon they support the podcast by donating a recurring monthly sum i appreciate the shit out of my patrons they are the capitalistic engine that keeps this podcast going would i be doing this podcast if i didn't have patrons sure i would be doing it is it nice to have a little pecuniary interest is that the word pecuniary a pecuniary interest for some remuneration Probably fucked both of those words up, but the answer is yes, folks. And what does that mean? That's just more financial, high vocabulary word, bullshit jargon for I like money. Give me your money, folks. I'm not going to complain. I'm going to bitch and moan about the financial system, and at the same time, I will gladly accept your patrons. Maybe that says something about me as an individual. You can make that decision on your own. I do want to thank some of my patrons first and foremost, and then we're going to get a kick in with Guy Adami in literally just a couple of moments. First and foremost, I want to thank the patrons that keep the podcast going on a daily basis. Who is that? Those are my friends at Quantumize.com, Q-U-A-N-T-A-M-I-Z-E. There is a link to Quantumize.com, a free trial in the podcast description. They are uh, they have an AI and factor research platform that helps individual investors, not the big hedge fund swinging D's, but the little guy like me, like you, the degenerate, the guys that drink Paps Blue Ribbon. It's going to help us find quantitative research and do the type of quantitative research that was generally only reserved for big hedge fund managers. We can plow through 10,000 stocks, options, and cryptos, and the quantumized platform was recently called the number one alternative to a Bloomberg terminal by Benzinga. So if you don't want to spend 25000 a year on a Bloomberg terminal, give the folks at Quantumize a try first. Link is in the podcast description. Also, to my brother over at BehindTheBid.com. Behind the Bid is a daily pre-market YouTube show for stock traders and investors. Every morning on the show, you're going to get eight tickers with news and sentiment on Twitter. It's a curated list of the most interesting stock news 
of the day. You're going to get it all in about 10 minutes. Okay, so start your day off. Spend eight minutes. Check out the Behind the Bid podcast and maybe pick up a little extra information before you go and start buying weekly calls that expire in a matter of hours that are 400% outside the money. But check out our friends over at BehindTheBid.com. Also, too, my brothers over at Corvus Gold are checking in. My brother, Scott Corsi, is checking in. He's the author of Debt Slave Economics. The link to that book is also in the podcast description. My brother, Nathan Mashad, over at Investors Underground, has checked in. And my friends like Chris Bede, Ken R., Chris Boas, Russ Valenti, Nathan Weiss, Andre Gagnon, my brother Mike, my brother Matt Merle, my brother Chris Sharkey. You guys keep the wheels to this podcast turning, and I appreciate the shit out of you. Last but not least, I do want to shout out some of my newer patrons since the last podcast. There's only been a few, and then we're going to get to the goods. My man Nathan Weiss, my man Lyle Engel just checked in, shot me a nice email today. My brother TJ Brown is in the house. Paul T. Breed, a.k.a. The Unreasonable Rocket. Whatever the fuck that means, he's in the house. My brother Jesse Stroik has been checking in since the Herbalife days. Appreciate the shit out of you, Jesse. Again, my friends over at InvestorsUnderground.com. Money Lobster. Andrew Lukers is in the house. Dee's Nuts is in the house. And finally, let's just do one more because we got to get it cracking right now. How about Rideshare Consultants NZ and my friend David Hansen. I appreciate the shit out of all you guys. Folks, it's time to turn this one on its head. It's time to take this financial some bitch and flip it upside down. And we're going to do that by getting the one, the only Guy Adami on the line. And we have right now with us CNBC's own, although I have a feeling he's not beholden to CNBC as an individual. So I don't know if that's the best way to introduce him. But we have Mr. Guy Adami on the line. Sir, how are you today? First of all, the sir stuff, my father was a sir. I'm just plain old guy, and it's great to be with you, and I'm fantastic today. <laughs> now, is it true or false that in our five-second uh, pre-podcast interview, I said, it's nice to finally speak to you, you know? You said, I'm just a guinea on TV. That is completely 100% true. But if you really want to get down to brass tacks, and I tell people this all the time, I'm actually half Italian, half Sicilian. And for those of you out there that know what I'm talking about, there is a distinction. <laughs> yep, there certainly is. Look, the first thing I want to tell you right off the bat is, so first off, I, I haven't ever spoken to you before up until about maybe maybe a week ago when I was running my mouth on Twitter, which is what I do best. And you had written something about the Fed and I gave you the business on Twitter and I came out and I said, hey, you know, you should say that on your show. Now, of course, I was firing without having any information at all because I don't watch Fast Money. I've watched it a few times and I got a little annoyed with it and stopped watching it. But certainly I didn't watch close enough to understand your position or your viewpoint on anything. And immediately all of my Twitter followers and many of your followers did a great job in correcting me and making sure that I knew that, hey, secretly deep down, Guy Adami is like part of the resistance. So <laughs> first and foremost, brother, and after doing a little bit of research on my own, I've come to those conclusions. The very first thing is I owe you an apology for giving you shit on Twitter without knowing no, what I was talking about. not at all. About. Come on, man. Not at all. Listen, first of all, you're a gentleman for even saying that. There's no apology necessary. And I understand... Um, you know, I understand people coming to the show and, and walking away sometimes with a bad taste in their mouth and, you know, who are these guys and, you know, what's their game and they're just entertainers and, and I get all that. And, but what I will tell you is, first of all, you don't need to apologize. You're a gentleman for coming back like you did and, and for having a, a great conversation. And again, it's an honor to be with you. And secondly, you know, and I, I talk about this on the show to the extent that time allows. You know, I think the Federal Reserve, you know, I've said this before and I'll say it right now. I think one of the biggest villains of the 21st century is going to prove to be Ben Bernanke. And I know he, in a lot of, in a lot of places, he's revered as this hero. Uh, I, I think time will tell a much different story and we can absolutely have that conversation. Yeah, I would love to, man. And I just, I know as soon as I started to read back through some of your tweets, and started to just generally do a little bit of research. And that's why I always tell people listening to this show and following me on Twitter, do your research elsewhere, that, uh, that I, had you, I had you wrong. Um, so certainly I do want to talk about that. 
I guess first and foremost, I'll say, how about this guy? I, the one of the questions I want to ask you right off the bat is, is it you know knowing that about you, is it bothersome to you that the financial news networks, and I'm not just talking about CNBC, I'm talking about really the networks and the industry. Does it bother you that the tone and the the indoctrination for everybody, it's kind of automatically assumed that the Fed is fantastic and that they must know what they're doing and that everything's great? Pisses me off. It, it makes me crazy. And, you know, what you learn, and again, just for background, I'm not a journalist. I, you know, I play one on TV, I guess, and we can talk about how this show came to pass. But, you know, I started my career in 1986 at Drexel Burnham, so I'm a career Wall Street guy for better or for worse. And, you know, this show came to pass in a number of interesting ways that we can talk about. But what I'll say is, and something that I've learned you know, everybody says that they want the truth. Tell me the truth. I want to know the truth. And I think that's complete bullshit. People want to hear what helps them get through the day and what helps them get to sleep at night. So right. although they want to, th you know, they think they want the truth, they, that's not really what they want. They just want to help. They just want to hear what makes them feel good. And in terms of your question, yeah, it makes me crazy. Uh, sure, the Fed, our Federal Reserve, and, and central banks now around the world have done a lot to bolster markets, um, but in, in, in doing so, what have they done to economies? I mean, that's the real question. So it makes me nuts. Now, unfortunately, it's a conversation that can make your eyes glaze over, and it's really not one that's made for TV, because as you know, TV is still an entertainment medium. And I'm not suggesting our show is just entertainment by any means. I think we try to entertain but we also try to educate. But if you really want to go down this rabbit hole of the Federal Reserve and what it's done, I mean, it's really not that TV friendly. So I understand why different networks and the different media outlets and publications will champion the Fed as if there's some great bastion of, uh, of capitalism. But quite frankly, they're anything but. But don't you think that in some regard, the media should have some... You know, I know you can't make a whole show about it, or maybe you can. Maybe me and you will co-host the show someday. But until then, you know, don't don't you feel as though just just blowing past it and not even addressing it? It's like this inherent long bias that the media has, right? Well, you, that's, you that's think, the you, other thing. You think that's healthy? No, I don't. And and this is something you know. I'll say it at you, and I've said it to folks at the network. And when we first started doing the show, I told them I said it's really important, in my opinion to take adjectives out of the equation. And what does that mean? It means that when Maria was hosting Closing Bell, she shouldn't start her show by saying, it's a great day in the market, the Dow Jones is up 150 points. Right. Or conversely, it's a bad day in the market because the Dow Jones is down 200 points because then you condition people to believe that's the, the, that up is good and bad is down. And I understand that for 99% of people, it's important for them to see the market go higher. But you can't, you can't brainwash, and that's probably too strong a term. No, it's not. But you not. can't indoctrinate people to believe that you know it's only good when the market goes higher. And I think it's a real problem. But I understand why it's done. And you know, you can fight your battles, and I can do the Don Quixote thing all I want. But you know, certain battles you're not going to be able to win. And and to your point. There is an inherent bias, obviously, for the, to be, well, for lack of a better phrase, a cheerleader. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't have said that better myself. I'm stunned to hear you say it. I'm already feeling remiss and annoyed with myself for not checking in with you sooner. But I think everything that you just said is dead on balls accurate, much of which I've said on this podcast before, which is, you know, one thing that I always started taking exception with when I started in on the markets and I started to understand like, hey, you know, in a market, things are supposed to go up and down. And I always say when I'm speaking somewhere or I'm, when I'm on guest podcasts, you know, this idea, pe people don't even understand that this idea that the market has always gone up and always has to go up, you know, under the system that we're in right now, if it's functioning the way the Fed wants it to, that that's really kind of a ridiculous concept. And one of the ways that it kind of caught my attention immediately years back was when I would tune in in the morning 
and you would watch the anchors talk about the futures trading prior to the market open. And if the futures were lower, it was a very gloomy kind of downbeat, you know, everybody was kind of had this sorry ass look on their face like, oh, the futures are down 150. You know, people are looking for explanations on a day to day basis. You know, what could this mean that the futures are down? The Dow futures are down 150 today. And conversely, when the futures were higher, it was a very upbeat and jovial discussion and people were bright eyed and bushy tailed. And and I think that plays into exactly what you're talking about, about conditioning the viewers, right? That's yeah, and and let me say this, and, and and I don't want there to, I don't want you to, I know you know this, but I'll I'll say that I work for, I don't work for CNBC, I'm a contributor to CNBC. There's a distinction, but it's not it's not necessarily important. But what I will say is, in my now close to 13 or so years, these are extraordinarily bright people, and these are extraordinarily hardworking people. So I don't want there to be any misunderstanding in terms of the level of, you know, uh, of intellect or work ethic. I mean, it's clearly there. I think part of the problem is, again, in my opinion, is that we've, we've become so conditioned to believe that, you know, the market can only go higher, the market goes higher in perpetuity, and if the market goes lower, there must be something nefarious going on or, you know, there must be some sort of, you know, glitch or whatever term you want to use and that's i think and i don't think it's done on i don't think it's done purposely but you've conditioned people to believe again that you know down days there must be something wrong and conversely on days that go up the the the, the commensurate amount everything is fine it's and it's for fundamental reasons so you know we we really it's important for people to understand that maybe what happened in october november into december of this year Maybe that was actually what the market should have been doing for the right reasons, and the subsequent bounce we're seeing is, is for the wrong reasons. Again, you know, that's just my view on things. I'm not suggesting I'm right. I'm just suggesting that that's how I sort of look at things. Well, in this conditioning, too, that we're talking about, it feeds on itself, right? So the more you indoctrinate whatever, retail investors, CNBC viewers, Bloomberg viewers, whatever you want to call them, right? The more you kind of indoctrinate the industry to expect that things are going to go higher, the worse and the more volatile the reaction is when things kind of break from that norm. And I think we saw it not only – not only do we see it on the news networks – when the market moves lower and people are just visibly, you know, shitting themselves on television because it's just so incomprehensible to them that it would that it could happen, that the market would go down, that the Dow could go down 100 points. What rational explanation could there be for this? But not only that, but it's I think it's responsible for conditioning the people that are in charge and the people that are the higher ups in the industry. And I think the case in point is Steve Mnuchin on Christmas Eve this year. Where after, you know, what you and I would probably call a much needed and very healthy 10 or 15 percent pullback in the equity markets that nearly tripled since the financial crisis. You know, this guy winds up having to go out and feels as though he's got to call the heads of the bank and then put out a statement on Treasury Secretary letterhead saying, by the way, there's ample liquidity everywhere. And then, of course, the market's like, hey, well... Who the fuck said anything about liquidity, number one? And then maybe there's a reason to panic now, right? right? And it's interesting. So he had that conversation that you speak of on Sunday, December 23rd, if memory serves, which I found interesting in and of itself. I think he was actually on vacation at the time, which, by the way, I'm not, I'm not making uh, a negative comment about it. I just found it interesting that while on vacation on a Sunday night, you know, two days before Christmas, he was calling around to the different banks to have a conversation that you just talked about. You know, where did that come from? But then on the other hand, you know, December 24th, you have that flush to the downside and almost without, you know, it's been straight up ever since. So say what you want, but to your point, I think, you know, the market said, wait a second, what's going on with this guy? And then all of a sudden it was, you know, Fed does their th sort of 180. President Trump talks about, you know, he has a feeling that the stock market's going to, you know, head higher again. And nine weeks later, we're 18 or so percent higher from where that December 24th law was. Really interesting stuff. And, you know, again, you know, I don't want to go down this, some crazy rabbit hole in terms of, you know, conspiracy theories and stuff, but, you know, the Fed's job is, 
they have a, the, the dual mandate that we talk about all the time, full employment and, you know, monitoring inflation. I, I happen to think, and, you know, you can, you can push back if you want, and I've said this on air, so I'm not talking out of school, but I really think the Fed's dual mandate is to make sure the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the NASDAQ goes higher every day. Well, do you think I'm going to push back on that? I mean, I think you're 100% right. So, you know, what I what the reason that I started this podcast, right, is because what what you're saying and what's very clear to people that listen to me and people that follow guys like, you know, Peter Schiff and some of these other, you know, Austrian style older classical style econ, uh, economists is that this stuff is so bread and butter blocking and tackling basic common sense. They're starting to be mystified by the fact that why why can't I just turn on the network news and hear that? Why can't I just hear somebody say the Fed's mandate is to make sure the stock market goes up? Because everybody knows it. Everybody in the industry knows it. You know, whether you buy into it or not, everybody knows that that's how they're making their decisions. All you got to do is watch a couple weeks of, you know, these FOMC minutes and, and how they change in reaction to the market. So how do we get how do we get more of that truth and what, what we would probably – look at as objective reality out to the lay person? Or do you think it's being held well, back from them on purpose? Listen, the truth is there if people want to take the time, as you did a week and a half, two weeks ago, to find it. To my earlier point, though, you know, everybody says, I want to know the truth, I want to know the truth. I don't necessarily believe that's the case. I think, again, people think they want the truth, but what they really want is the, is the news, is, is, is the sense everything's going to be okay. I can go to bed tonight and wake up tomorrow and I'm going to get through the day. That's really what people want. Uh, again, my opinion. And I'm not saying this to be some... So I guess my question, Guy, would be, is that a good thing, you know, that people just want to hear what's going to help them sleep at night versus what's actually happening? Because what does that same person think the morning when they wake up and it, you know, it turns out that the company that they bought is a fraud, or it turns out that there's, you know, hidden liabilities on banks' balance sheets that could cause the whole system to go ass up. You know, is it is it good to kind of have that attitude all the time? Well, that's the rhetorical question of all time. You obviously know the answer. The answer, of course, it's not a good thing. It's not at all. I and mean, people should want to know the truth. They should want to understand why markets go higher, and if markets are going higher for the right reasons, or if markets are going higher. Uh, for reasons that don't really make a lot of sense. So they should seek the truth. And I think in terms of finance and in terms of investing, for the longest time, the great myth or the great um, fallacy was, don't worry, folks, the Wall Street guys and gals know a lot better than you do when it comes to your money. And if 0809 taught us anything, it's that's complete horseshit. You know, we nobody cares more about your money than you do, and that's something when I go and talk to people, it's one of the first things I say. So, you know, fool me once, shame on me, you know, or fool me once, shame right. on you, fool me once, fool me twice, shame on me type of thing. And that's, I think, where we're on the verge of now. So when we created our show, to go back to Fast Money quickly, sure. we, did it, we did it not to be a stock-picking show. That was not what we were trying to do, although we talk about stocks, obviously. The premise of our show and the reason for being for our show was to get people higher up on the learning scale, right, to force people to raise their game. One of the things we talked about early on was we didn't want to dumb this show down. We wanted to force people to raise their game. And to a large extent, we did. And what it happened was people learned the right questions to ask. So they started asking their advisors, hey, what about this? What's going on here? And in some ways, and I'm not trying to be too um, melodramatic here, but in some ways, I think that helped the industry because a lot of these advisors had to raise the level of their game because they were being asked questions that they'd never been asked before. So that's one of the things that Fast Money tried to do. And we can debate whether it's been successful or not. But to answer your original question, people should want to know the truth, and they should want to understand. Now, one of the things I say on the show all the time, and what I'll say here is, price, in fact, is truth. Because at the end of the day, the ultimate decision maker is price. So, you know, the S&P closed today at 2800 within a few handles, let's just say. So although I might think the real value of the S&P is 2250, it doesn't matter what I think because it closed today at 2800. So 
every decision you make has to be based off that price. Right. And, and I don't know if that makes sense or not, but, you know, all conversations are ended with, yeah, but the market's higher. And that can be extraordinarily frustrating because, yes, that's true, but deep down you know and I know, yeah, it's higher, but it's higher for what I believe to be the wrong reasons. Now, I, I, I know that can, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day when you open up your 401K, if you're up 18%, doesn't say it doesn't have an asterisk next to us. It's not a Roger Maris situation. It is what it is. But you also have to be willing to accept the fact that, hey, this thing can turn on a dime. And if you go back to May of 2010, you recall that one day. And if you go back to uh, Facebook earnings last summer when the stock went down 23% in six minutes, I think you learned a difficult lesson then. And then obviously from October 3rd until Christmas Eve, you saw how quickly things can go down as well. So in keeping with what you're talking about, which is kind of price is truth and how do we kind of empower people to understand, you know, that concept, because I, I think you're dead on balls accurate, right? I think, you know, regardless of whether or not you price the S&P at 2250 personally, if it's at 2800, that's what you have to work with. So the way I've always kind of thought about investing in anything and, and markets in anything, whether you're talking about soybean futures or you're talking about, you know, a company's debt or you're talking about, you know, Apple or you're talking about Tesla or you're talking about the price of gold, you know, that you're going to, you know, if you're performing your analysis on your own and you trust yourself, number one, and you've empowered yourself, number one, like you're talking about, you're going to come to a realization that an equity, an option, a future, a commodity, whatever, is either overpriced or underpriced, right? And depending on that, you have three things you can do. One is nothing. You can watch. You know, two is you can position yourself long, and three is you can position yourself short, right? Barring all these exotic strategies. So, don't you think it would be empowering to people to understand that there are different ways and different methods to invest aside from just buying and holding, you know, the, the Buffett, the Siegel method, um, if, you know, price is truth, like you're saying? Do I think there are other options for people? Absolutely. Do I think, you know, when it comes to these things, people get lazy? Absolutely. And, you know, you, you've probably talked about it on your podcast or on Twitter. People spend more time planning their summer vacation than they do planning you know, their retirement accounts. And that's, that's a problem. I think that's a tremendous problem. And again, I think part of the reason is because they, they feel intimidated by it and they, they're always, when it comes to matters of markets and money, they always think that somebody knows better than they do. And where there's that, there might be some truth to that, what I'll tell you is, and I'll say again for emphasis, there might be people that know more about it than you do, but when it comes to your money, nobody cares about your money more than you do. So right. if you're trusting it to somebody else, understand that they probably don't have the same vested interest by definition as you do. And I think it's really important to, to do your homework. And you know, again, I, I try to have these conversations. I'll give you a good example. Um, it was August, 2015. And just for complete you know, transparency, I was raised in a Wall Street, what can go wrong will go wrong. So I am by definition always a half empty person, just so you understand how I'm wired. I have an inherent bias for negativity, for wow. better or for worse. But with that said, you know, I'm also very respectful of price action. I understand why things go higher, and I understand you can be negative but still say that, you know, different securities can go higher. I get all that, and I'm not trying to play both sides of the fence. That's just reality. But in August 2015, um, I don't remember the exact date, but I do remember that the Chinese devalued their currency. And for the first time in my life, I sent an email to all my brothers and sisters, my brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws, and I said, look, I'm, I'm putting this out here now. I have a very bad feeling about what's going to happen over the next couple of months. This is what's going on. This is what I see. I'm not suggesting you do anything but speak to somebody about it. And if you want to have a further conversation, we can. And if you remember, um, over the next couple of months, the market sort of went pear-shaped, culminating, I believe, on February 10th or so, 2016, when the S&P traded down to 1810. 
I guess my point is um, I'm very sensitive to this. And when I think the time is right, I absolutely try to get on top of the mountaintop and say, hey, this is what's about to happen. The problem is you only have so many of those bullets in your gun. And if you play them on every day, you become the boy that cried wolf. Again, hopefully this is – I'm not trying to not answer your question. I'm just trying to give it from my, my perspective. No, and I, I think you make a really great point, right, in the environment, for better or worse, that we're in, where the default setting is up, that you probably do only have X amount of bullets in your gun if you want to you know, swim upstream or you want to kind of – you want to try and take the uh, you know non popular viewpoint, the overall, the broader non popular viewpoint. So I think I think you make a good point there. I want to just go back and touch on one thing that you said earlier too, which is that you know all the guys on the network and the guys that you work with, you know, are good, hardworking people, and um, you know they all want to do the right thing. And I you know I don't doubt that at all. As a matter of fact, you know you know I've met John and Pete, and I've seen them in Vegas a couple of times and had the pleasure of meeting them. And I think they're very nice people and they couldn't be more down to earth. And certainly, you know, you're a very down to earth person, too. And I also met Tyler Madison, who I thought was a very down to earth and honest and humble guy with a great sense of humor. And it, to me, it just mystifies me to, you know, to see the players involved and a guy like yourself, who's obviously, you know, 10 times sharper than I'm ever going to be and obviously understands the game so well. And then, you know, how, how come I can't draw a straight line between all these great people that seem to get it off the record with what everybody's saying on the record? And that's, you know, I don't know. That's No, and that's fair. You know, look, and that's fair. And I can't, and, and I, I can only speak for myself, right? So, and, and I'll do that. And in terms of speaking, I, I, you know, I'm pretty open book you know, in terms of my Twitter account, in terms of the conversations I have on air, in terms of the conversations I have with people off air when, you know, I'm, I'm doing different speaking things. And, and I think one of the things I said to you before we started is, you know, ask me any question you want. Right. Yep. I'm going to answer it honestly. And, 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 I, and, I, and I stand by that. So, again, I understand what you're saying. Like, if you feel that strong, if Guy Adami feels that strongly about this, this is something that he should be hammering home 24-7. And, and there's a certain aspect of that that's true. But what I will tell you again, and I think you understand this is, you can't be that voice. You can't be that hammer every day because you actually do yourself more of a disservice than service because people will, by definition, tune you out, which is one of the reasons. And I happen to like Peter Schiff a great deal. I've met Peter. I know Peter. I, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of his work. I think he does extraordinarily thoughtful work. But Peter bangs the same drum every single day, and he does it in a way that's less than um, elegant, for lack of a better word. You know, he's very in your face. He's somewhat abrasive. I think he sort of feeds on that, but he also gets drowned out. His, his constant hammering actually does him more of a disservice than it does a service. Now, at a certain point, Peter will prove him to be correct, but, you know, again, people will say, oh, that Schiff, yeah, He's finally right after all these years, so they won't, won't even give him the credit he deserves because he's been such a steadfast, you know, same, same drum beat, you know, same message song every single day. He, you have to allow for um, the market to be irrational. You have to try to be thoughtful with the understanding that the market can be irrational a lot longer than, than you can be rational. Does that make sense? It does make sense to some degree, but on the other hand, you know, it raises the question of if he doesn't buy into how monetary policy is taking place in this country. I mean, your argument is kind of, look, if you're if you're a permanent bear and you think the system is bullshit and you think the way that the Fed is running things is bullshit, you know, on a pretty widely systemic level, not just like, hey, I'm opposed to QE3. But just like, you know, this idea that, you know, we constantly have to be bailing out companies, that we can print unlimited amounts of money without repercussion, that we can continue to, you know, be a debtor nation instead of a creditor nation. And really just your whole thought process on monetary policy as a whole, you know, I feel like you're making the argument like, OK, it's all right to have that viewpoint, but you need to acknowledge that the Dow Jones is going to go up because this is the kind of system we're in. And I and my guess would be that Peter would say something to the effect of. You know, why even give that little if, you know, if like you just said, you're so certain that 
he'll be proven to be right someday. Why shouldn't he be on, you know, going against the grain full force Gale instead of making these concessions and saying, well, you know, the whole thing's bullshit, but Bernanke's in charge, so I expect equities to double and, you know, try to catch that rally while it happens. No, that's fair. No, look, I think you make a good point. I, I think you make a fair point, and I think, you know, Peter's voice um, is definitely out there. Now, you'll, you'll say to me, well, he hasn't been on CNBC in a long time, and, I, you know, I can't speak to the reasons why. I, I'm, you know, that's above my pay grade. I don't think he's banned from the network. But also tell you this, and I think there's some truth to this as well. I think if if Peter was, well, I'll say it. I mean, if he was a little more likable in his delivery, I think he'd probably get a lot more airtime. And I think you would acknowledge that, you know, he at times can be abrasive. And abrasive doesn't necessarily work that well on television as well. And, and I'm not speaking out of school. You know, I've said this to Peter face-to-face, and I think he would probably acknowledge that. I think he enjoys that but it doesn't make for um it doesn't make for the best tv i think even you would acknowledge that yeah but also so i think you're right first and foremost um but second i don't get the impression from him that you know his set of priorities is to be abrasive first and argue his point second i think he argues his point and when he has to deal with a woman on msnbc who's saying the solution to more debt is taking on more debt. The solution that you can't put, you know, and Peter's got to argue a fucking point that is so, you know, so common sense and so just basic econ 101. You can't pay off debt with debt. And he's got to square off against somebody that wants to argue with him about that. How can you not be even the, you know, personally, I don't find him abrasive. I think he's quite funny, actually, sometimes. But I think he is, he doesn't give a lot. And I think... You know, the fact that he's not necessarily likable by whatever standards we're talking about, network TV standards, even though I find him to be charming and pleasant when I watch him on television, um, you know, then his point doesn't really get a fair shake because he's kind of sticking to his guns, right? Right. And it's also getting back to the, the, how we started this to a large extent. The, you, you know, people want, people don't want to hear the naysayers. You know, they want to hear... Listen, if you want to go down the political route, people that watch Fox watch it because it, it, it reinforces their belief system. And to a certain extent, the same thing is true with CNN and MSNBC and so on and so forth. In terms of the market, you know, we, as I said, you know, 99% of the people want to go market go higher. So the voices that talk about, you know, this market's going to go up in perpetuity, that speaks to their belief system and it works in their personal echo chambers. And Peter obviously is a voice that doesn't. So by definition, that's going to rub people the wrong way. But getting back to another point you made, I think it's incumbent upon the viewer at a certain point to ask him or herself, hey, wait a second, you know, what is this Peter Schiff guy all about? Or when Guy Adami talks about Ben Bernanke being the biggest villain of the 21st century, what is he talking about? I think at a certain point, people have to take responsibility themselves to sort of do, do a deeper dive. Does that, is that fair? It does. It's, I think that's very fair, and it makes a hell of a lot of sense because it's very similar to the road that I took to arrive at the conclusions that I arrived at. And I think I have this benefit, to be honest with you, of not coming from within the financial system. Not you know, I wasn't born in a household where my parents worked in finance. I didn't go to an Ivy League institution. I didn't study finance in college. So... You know, I said at the beginning of this speech I did in May, I was just raised in a household with a very low bullshit tolerance where, you know, economics was handled by you save money and you don't take on debt. And that's where prosperity comes from. And so naturally, as I started to learn about the capital markets and learn a little bit more about monetary policy and economic theory, that that immediately kind of shoved me to, like you said, the glass half empty, the pessimistic, the, the, the side of skepticism, the side of, you know, Show me the proof and the side of, you know, the Austrian economists and, and that type of monetary policy. Well, what, what I find fascinating is, you know, we've become a society when your parents, when your parents were in the, and your grandparents grew up, you know, they lived in a society that you, you bought what you could afford. We are now a society that buys what you can afford the payments for. Right. And that's, that's a subtle difference, but it's an extraordinarily important difference and to your point you know 
not only have we as individuals embraced debt, but think about what we've done to our think about what we've done to our economy right now. And I don't want to go down this wonkiness of economics, but you know, I think debt to GDP in the United States, depending on what numbers you want to use, is somewhere between 95 percent and 105 percent. I mean, that is right. outrageous in my opinion. Now. The market doesn't seem to care, and I'm not certain when the market will care. I mean, you have other economies. I think China is closer to 270 percent of debt to GDP. So right. it's pretty staggering what's going on globally. But the pushback will be, well, markets don't care, so why should we care? Well, we should care. Um, I, in my opinion, we should care a great deal. I, and I will tell you that, you know, I think history is littered with disastrous outcomes born of wonderful intentions. And I'll tell this little anecdote, because when I speak, this is one of the things I talk about. But October 8th of 1871 was the day of the Great Chicago Fire. As fate would have it, it was also the day of a fire in Peshtigo, Wisconsin. It killed anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 people, depending on what textbook you read. And from that fire, the National Forestry Service was born with their sole purpose effectively being fire sequestration. And why is that? Because, well, they're unsightly, they're destructive, and guess what? They're deadly as well. And for a long time, they were able to do exactly that. But what they learned is fires, forest fires, are an essential part of the cycle, right? right. Old trees burn down, right. new growth comes up, and it's unsightly and it sucks, but it's essential. And what wound up happening is trees that were prior impervious to fire were falling victims because these fires were now 10 times worse. So, Guy, what's your point? Well, here's my point. Alan Greenspan in the 1980s came up with this great idea that, hey, wait a second. You know, we could extract the recession portion of the cycle out. And he was successful in doing that, right? They were able to orchestrate that with Fed policy, and it worked really well. Problem is, downturns, recessions, are an essential part of the cycle. You have to let them happen. You have to let dar corporate Darwinism to take over. And if you don't, the downturns, which would have been bad, are gonna be 10 times worse. And I think you saw that manifest itself in, in 99, 2000, and to a certain extent, a large extent, you saw the same thing happen in 08, 09. And again, well-intentioned. I'm sure Mr. Greenspan is a great guy. I've never met him, but disastrous outcomes. And now we're on basically the precipice of a similar type thing because the Fed is not in a position or won't allow themselves to be in a position to let the market correct to levels that it should be at. Again, my opinion. I think you're 100% right. OK, I think you're 100 percent right. And anytime you go to try to take an essential part out of, you know, the free market cycle like you're talking about, all you're doing is throwing the rest of the system way out of whack, way, you know, becomes very distorted. It moves way out of proportion to the way that it's supposed to be. And that's when you start getting these, you know, massive three, four sigma moves in the market when nobody's expecting it or you wake up one day and the entire housing market has gone tits up and nobody knows why. Ben Bernanke doesn't know why. Nobody on CNBC knows why. Retail investors don't know why. Realtors don't know why. You know, and that's why we kind of reach these inflection points. So given everything that you just said, which is, hey, pretty much starting with Greenspan, the Fed has gone from, you know, maybe just fucking up the works a little bit to putting us inevitably onto a bubble that is going to be bigger than 2008 at some point. I mean, the way you're speaking about it just now, it seems to me you're making the same point I always make, which is these are just Band-Aids and it's inevitable again. So just to take you back again to Peter Schiff, what we were just talking about, isn't that more important to get out there than for somebody to be likable on TV when they're making their point? 100%. 100%. But maybe I'm probably not making the point about likability. I'm, I'm probably not making as well as I should. You know, you can't, you can't go on, you know, on a daily basis and, and bang the same drum because you get, you get drowned out. You have to be able to do, you have to be able to pick your spots and you have to do it when, you know, the market gives you an opportunity to do it. And the, the news cycle is such 
that there's an opportunity to do it. Uh, for example, but that's only that's only on if you want to be a skeptic, though. That's only if you want to, if you know, if you want to be somebody that's trying to point out the short side of things or the bearish side of things, then you can't beat the same drum every day. But if you're if you're talking about the market going up, you can beat that drum every day. No, that's fair. No, and listen, I. It's it's a very you know again and I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to make excuses for myself I'm not I know I'm flawed and I I do the best I can but you know I find myself you know you go back and forth between you know you want to make sure people know where you stand on certain things but you have to be respectful of what's t taking place in the market like you sure. can't just bury your head and say well shit I know this thing should be lower so it's going low it's going low it's going low because then what you want to accomplish is people listening to you. It accomplishes the exact opposite. People stop listening to you, and that's the last thing that you want. So it's a really difficult um, tightrope to walk. And again, I'm not looking for – it's not me looking for sympathy, or I'm not trying to create that at all. What I'm trying to say is, I guess, you know, you do the best you can. It's, it's interesting. You know, it's not – well, I shouldn't, it's not easy, and not that it's, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing labor here, I'm not out, out with a jackhammer every day, but <laughs> you know, it's not easy to be on TV every day and, and try to bring forth truth, but try to do it in, in a way that is um, understandable, right. and it's a way that, uh, you know, it, you have to sort of hold your audience, you have to make it entertaining for them, you have to give them a takeaway, but you can't be so dogmatic that then people turn you off entirely because then you're not doing anybody any good. Does that make a little bit of sense? It makes it makes perfect sense. And I don't want you to think that, you know, I'm trying to hold your feet to the fire personally or I'm trying to give you shit about it personally because that's not that's not the case. It's just for me, it's fascinating to be able to speak to somebody like yourself, A, who understands this, you know, but B, also has this other interesting perspective of, hey, you know, you're a contributor on a major financial network. So, um, you know, the, I'm just trying to talk about this stuff for the purposes of discussion. And the point that you're making of how do you get that message across without, you, you could even argue, if you're looking at it on a day-to-day -day basis, like what critics of guys like Peter Schiff would say, is he's wrong all the time, and then eventually he's you know he's right for a year or two, and then as the market continues higher, he's quote unquote wrong for all that time. So I, you know, I think you're a hundred percent right. I'm sure that there's a delicate balance that you guys have to strike, especially if you want to get that point across effectively. Is that right? That's fair. I think that's really fair, and. You know what's even easier, and again, I'm 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 just saying in general, it's it's even easier to just be, you know, everything's fine. You know, every pullback's a buying opportunity, and you know, you just sort of play that mantra, and that's a drum that you can beat without any real repercussions, because that's what people want to hear. So that's the flip side of that coin, I guess. Yeah, I think you're 100 percent right, and that makes it easy for that to be the content to fall back on or the content, you know, the bedrock with which the financial media kind of sits upon, right? Yeah, to a certain extent. But again, if you watch our show, you know, we definitely try to have difficult conversations. And I'm not suggesting that we do it well every single night because, you know, nobody can be good every single night. But we definitely try to push back and, and have thoughtful discussions around what's, you know, at times – difficult subject matter. Um, you know, it's, it, it's funny, you know, when it comes to money and stuff, it, it's, you know, it, you're, it's sort of the third, it's a, it is very much a third rail, you know, and, a, and if, if you put things out that, you know, people don't want to hear, you better make sure you have something to back it up. And, and what I find fascinating, and you're, you're a denizen of Twitter, so you know, but, you know, you also know and realize that people hear and people see what they want to hear and see, right. right? And it's that to me. That's the that's one of the most difficult things that I've had to deal with, in terms of you know you you try to be as crystal clear in your messaging as you possibly can be, yet people perceive it and they interpret it the way they want, and I find that to be maddening and and fascinating at the same time. Yeah, and it's. It's interesting because you guys are actually are you five or five thirty your show? We're from we're so our show is five to six, 
we just had our 12 year anniversary in January. So we've been on air quite a long time and for better, or for worse, I'm the only original one left from, you know, the, the, the group that actually started in late 2005, believe it or not. Well, congratulations on the 12th year. Do you think, do you think leading into a show like mad money, you know, kind of, may push you a little bit more, motivate you a little bit further to make sure you kind of try and, you know, go upstream a little bit more and maybe try to, you know, I know Kramer is a good guy and I know people that know him and I know a lot of people like him and they say he's a, you know, great person and separate from what he's like as a person outside of his television personality. You know, you think, does it feel like leading into a show like that, you know, maybe, maybe that's a good spot to try and maybe even be a little bit more skeptical, maybe even try to inject a little bit more, I don't know if you want to call it discomfort or truth or whatever you want to call it to the viewer before you kind of send them off on that ride. It's interesting you say that. You know, I've never thought of that. Um, I, I've never had that go through my head. Uh, and, and you said it, and I'll say it as well. You know, Jim, Jim has forgotten more about markets than I'll ever know. I'll say that, and I don't say that to be a kiss-ass. I mean, that's true. Jim you'd be shocked at how hard Jim works on a daily basis. He really is passionate about this stuff. Now, people might not like his delivery or, you know, they might sort of throw him in, in a category that he probably doesn't deserve to be in, in terms of, you know, Jim's always just a cheerleader for stocks. I don't think that's true. You've obviously heard those things as have I, I'll tell you this though as well. And I think you understand this. We're five people for an hour. Jim's one person for an hour. That's an immensely different show and, and in a lot of ways a far more difficult show to do. So I've never personally have never felt um, pressure to be sort of a, a d d descending or, or a different voice leading into Jim. Some of the best TV that, that I've done over these years have been with Jim on at the same time because you know I've had this pushback with Jim and you know I disagree and, and I'm pretty verbal about it. And I'm, you know, I disagree with Jim's view that the fed was making the wrong choice, but that's what makes markets. I respect his opinion. Sure. I just happen to disagree with it. You know, I think the fed was doing what was right. I liked the October Jerome Powell fed chairman because I felt yep. for the first time since Paul Volcker, there was somebody that was doing the right thing for our economy. Right. And our economy is much different than our market. Now, this is an entirely different conversation, but I also understand the importance of the market to our economy. And if I can briefly touch on that, I offer you the following. You know, people talk about a recession paving the way for a stock market downturn. I happen to believe it's the opposite. I think a stock market sell-off causes right. a recession. And right. why do I think that? Because 73% of our economy is driven by the consumer. In my opinion, all consumer optimism is, is an overlay of the S&P 500. And I'm not suggesting because people own stocks, that's not my point. I think when the populace sees the market going higher every day, they say to themselves, well, the stock market's going higher, that must mean the economy's doing well. Right. If the economy's doing well, I should be able to buy that Starbucks coffee or that dishwasher or fill in the blank. But when the market turns lower in a precipitous way, and when Brian Williams or Dan Rather, I'm showing my age, I know, but when they lead the six o'clock news with the Dow Jones was down some 700 points today, when that's the leading story of the news, then people say, well, wait a second, maybe the economy's not as strong, and maybe I shouldn't buy that Starbucks coffee. So a prolonged market sell-off, in my opinion, that's what precipitates a recession. So in many ways, I understand the p predicament the Fed finds themselves in because by doing the right thing, by raising rates and shrinking our balance sheet, they're going to strengthen our economy, in my opinion, but it's going to hurt the market. So they find themselves in, in a position that they put themselves in, by the way, in a situation that they can't get themselves out of. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And it, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy to that degree because when the consumer is looking to the stock market for their prompt on whether or not they should be going out and 
spraying their money on retail sales instead of understanding the difference between the stock market and the economy, which I'm sure it's very difficult to do since the Fed treats the stock market like it's the economy. Um, I think you're 100% right. People see the market go down. They see their accounts go down. They see that arrow is red when they open up the Fidelity 401k or whatever normal people look at when I'm trading weekly options and losing 100% of my capital. Um, you know, th those people are those people look at that and they say, okay, bad, you know, time to pull money out. And that, you know, very similar to the way that spending dries up and that kind of triggers a recession in the sense that deleveraging starts and, you know, since we gauge the entire economy on spending and that's how things are going and not whether or not we have a good balance sheet or not, I think you're 100% right. That that prompts the recession. It, in many ways, it's the tail wagging the dog, similar to the way that I think People in there a lot of times trading the indices and the ind the index futures are the ones that are leading stocks higher or lower. And the stocks that are supposed to be components of an index, um, you know, are not determining what the index price is. You'll see a spike. Right. The index, the index, you're 100 percent right. Again, another conversation. But, you know, these indexes drag up the, the underlying stocks. So you have rising tide lifting all boats. And that's Again, that's a problem because you don't allow, and again, my opinion, you don't allow Darwinism to take over. I mean, these bad companies are being bolstered in terms of their stock price just by virtue of the fact that they're in an index or an ETF that's right. been doing quite well. It doesn't really doesn't make a lot of sense. And I, I also say that, you know, I think passive investing has become the de rigueur, right? I mean, everybody's passive investing, and I get it, but... You know, my big concern is, you know, passive investing is great when things are going higher, but when passive becomes active, it ain't going to be on the way up, if that makes sense. And I think you follow what I'm saying. So the real concern is, you know, when active takes over, it ain't going to be active going up. It's going to be active on the way down. And as you've seen in your career, and I know in mine, you know, markets take the stairs up and the elevator down, and you've seen it a number of times over the last few years. Yeah, and I think, you know, all of these articles that we've seen over the last year or two about, you know, our hedge fund managers still worth the 2 and 20 and, you know, Ackman's down and Einhorn's down and do these guys have any fucking clue what they're doing? Meanwhile, the S&P, some, you know, normal schlub that puts his money into the SPY and lets it sit in an ETF to make an 8-9% a year. And one of the points I've made on my podcast over and over and on other people's podcasts is that when we start to hit a point where it becomes either a stock picker's market or the market starts to pull back, people are once again going to realize the value of people that are running active funds and people that do, you know, they buy deep value in short bubbles. You just, you can't do that right now. And now just going back to what you were saying about a rising tide lifting all boats and the indices kind of pulling up a lot of these shit companies that don't deserve their stock price to go up regardless of their valuation i want to pick your brain as to maybe one or two names that you're thinking of well so let's just you know it's interesting and and you know it's some, one of the conversations and i don't know and i apologize so i don't know when the podcast is going to drop but so t today is tonight tuesday so it's a drop tonight so today on, on fast money today uh one of the conversations came out about stock buybacks and one of my points was, one of, again, one of the many unintended consequences of in a very accommodative central bank, Federal Reserve, is it's made corporate America to a large extent lazy. And what does that mean? Well, when money's cheap, you know, all you have to do is borrow money, buy back your stock, stock goes higher, everybody's, everybody's happy. And I guess that's true to a point, but the problem is, you haven't focused on your underlying business. You haven't looked in a critical way of, you know, where should we be? Where should we be investing? You, know, you haven't taken the hard look because you don't have to. And I think if you really want two great examples of that, I mean, look no further than IBM and General Electric, who have been the poster children for stock buybacks over the last decade. And you know, I'm not, I, I'm not suggesting that necessarily they're lazy, but if you think about it, you know, they haven't had to make difficult decisions because they've just made financial engineering decisions that are, are much easier. So 
I'm, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, and ultimately, again, and ultimately, at the end of the day, you you sit and on one quarterly report, you're watching four, five, six years worth of gains disappear, and all the capital that these companies kind of threw with their problems when they were buying back their stock at inflated prices, it's gone. You know, it's incinerated, like it ceased to exist to begin with. The value is destroyed, right? That's a, and that's a problem. And, I, and again, I, I happen to think, you know, again, I don't think the Fed set out on that course to create that. Again, unintended cons. Again, disastrous outcomes born of good intentions, and that's one of them. So, I think it's. I think you got to let these these companies figure it out on their own. Like it's time. And I hate these glib terms, but you know, you have to take the training wheels off. But this is an example I think people listening will understand maybe a lot better. So we all know that processed sugar is really bad, right? It's it, one of the worst things you can put in your body, yet we all do it every day. You also know, if you've read, that if you can get off of it, if you can stop using it, it's liberating. It's, it's life-changing. Like, you become a much better person. The problem is getting from point A to point C is very difficult. Those two to three weeks of trying to wean yourself off is brutal. What's your point, guy? I'm glad you asked. It's the same thing we're going through now. We all know that, well, we all should know that what the Federal Reserve is doing feels good, but it's really bad for us. We should know that if they would ever normalize and get us back on stable footing, that's going to make us feel a lot better, and our economy is going to be a lot stronger. The problem is getting there, and we tried to get there, I believe, with this Fed chair. I think that's the direction he put us on, and the problem was the market called bullshit, and he flinched. I think if he had continued on that path and was steadfast, I think the market would have figured it out, and I think here we are now in beginning of March – I think we'd be a lot better off. Again, just my opinion. No, I, I agree with you 100%. And I think part of the problem is that the president is using the stock market like it's a fucking golf scorecard that he checks after every hole to see how, you know, his administration is doing and whether or not he understands what's going on. And because I don't know if you remember, the president campaigned on we're in a bubble. And day one, when well, he came I Go ahead. It's funny you say that, and I'm not looking to interrupt you, but I've said that a number of times on air. It's interesting that when President Trump was candidate Trump, he correctly said that the Federal Reserve was creating a stock market bubble. He happened to be right. But what's funny is, and not, it's not unpredictable, but interesting that now that he's President Trump, he's taken a complete 180 on that, which is unfortunate. You know, but I also understand that you're not going to win elections on the platform of it's time for us to take our medicine. That's not what's going to win elections. It should win you an election, but it won't. So like you talk about Trump winning the election or winning a re-election ostensibly because he did win the election campaigning on we're in a bubble. I think he was just looking to criticize, however, you know, however he needed to to make his point that he was against the system. But maybe he's trying to win re-election by owning the stock market and saying things are going well. So I want to take that and I want to plug it back into our conversation about Jim Cramer, who recently said, and I just said on one of my last podcasts, I was making comments about his comment that the stock market is not in a Fed-induced bubble. And he said this, I think, three or four days ago or like mid last week. And my my problem with that was twofold, and I'd love to get your reaction on this. One is I obviously don't believe that to be the objective truth. That aside, what I have difficulty with is I have difficulty believing that Kramer doesn't understand exactly what's going on, too, and that maybe he kind of knows one thing and is saying another. And here's why I'm bringing it up in the context of our discussion about Donald Trump. Because, you know, when that video surfaced 10 years ago or eight years ago of Kramer on the street TV talking about the strategies that he employed at his hedge fund 
and the way that he would, you know, short stocks and then go buy a whack of puts to create some activity to make people think there was some bad news coming. Or he would take a story that may not have been the truth and turn around and feed it to a journalist to further his agenda for the day, whatever it was. If he was positioned short, he would also commented, maybe I would go into the futures market and create a level of activity to kind of get the futures where I wanted. When I hear something like that versus what this guy goes on television and says and versus what he says several days ago that the Fed is, you know, we're not in a, the stock market is not in a Fed induced bubble. That to me runs congruent with somebody who campaigns on saying we're in a bubble. And then once it's convenient for him, turns around and says, oh, I'm going to own this because the stock market's going up. Do you think that's kind of selling your soul to the devil a little bit? Or do you think maybe he doesn't know? I mean, what do you think about all that? All right, so again, I'm not gonna. I I'm a huge fan of Jim. He's a friend of mine, and you know I can't. If if you're asking me to speak to the integrity of Jim, you know I've always found him to be, you know, a, a totally stand up guy. Number one. So, and I can't do. If you're asking if I know that Jim, if he says one thing in terms of the Fed and believes another to be true, you know I can't speak to that. And I'm, I'm not going to say something stupid like you should get Jim on if you want the answer to that because that's just insulting to you. <laughs> and that's not that's not no. But my you know I, it's, it's not the way I would answer a question. But you know I find Jim to be a forthright stand-up guy. So I can't. It's hard for me to get in his head and say you know I know him that he says one thing but he knows another thing. I, I you know it's it's impossible for me to make that quantum leap. I don't believe that to be true. In terms of President Trump. I think you make a, an excellent point that, you know, he campaigned on one thing and now he's taking ownership of a stock market. Now, that might be politically expedient and might be the right thing to do. The problem is, you know, if you use the stock market for a report card, well, it's great when it's going up every day. But again, you, you know, those few weeks, October, November, December, that report card wasn't looking that great. So it's obviously in his interest for the stock market to go higher. And I think the one thing he looks at on a daily basis, again, I don't know this, but my sense is the president is exquisitely focused on the day-to-day -day performance of the stock market. And that's a real problem in my opinion. So I agree with you 100%. I'm sure Kramer is a very nice person. I'm sure he's a person of integrity, and he's a Philly boy. So, you know, I have some love for him in that in that regard. So here's what I'll rephrase my question by asking objectively whether or not you agree with his statement that we're not in a Fed-induced Oh, no, I, stock no, no, no. Bubble. So if you want, no, 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 I don't agree with that. And I've been, you know, I do think, again, it's hard, you know, the counterfactual thing gets very difficult. So as you know. But I, I absolutely believe that much of this rally, and when I say much, you know, more than 50 to 60 percent of this rally over the last decade is on the back of an extraordinarily accommodative central bank. And you say, well, how can you be sure? I'm not sure. But what I also say to you is, and we talked about this earlier, it's interesting how the stock market stopped on a dime, basically, once the Fed went did a total 180 in right. terms of their their commentary that's not coincidence so if you don't think the market is reliant on the federal reserve uh you know i, I happen to think you know you it's it, it, you're just not paying attention to really what's going on and i'm not suggesting jim's not paying attention i really believe much of this rally is predicated on an overly accommodative central bank all right, so here's a question that I asked the Nigerians in Vegas back in October um, that they kind of deflected the answer to. Well, they deflected half the answer to a little bit, and uh, I gave them the business about it then, and I'll continue to, but in a very loving way. Um, and I'd be interested on your take, and I, I would love for you to try and answer this, this question as objectively as possible uh, if you can, which I, I hope that you can. The, uh, and before I even ask, I want to give you an immense amount of credit because you did say on our pre-podcast interview phone call, which was about 30 seconds of like, hi, nice to meet you. I need to go get a drink. So do I. All right, let's get started. But you did say you can ask me anything you want. And you said, I'm going to talk to you just the way I would talk to anybody else. And that's like what this is about, this podcast is about. So first and foremost up front, I'm going to thank you for that. Now I'm going to ask my question. I want to know. For Guy Adami personally, not for the producer, not for your co-hosts, 
I want to know for you personally who a couple of your favorite guests are to have on and why. I also want to know who a couple of your favorite journal uh, journalists are to read in the industry. And then conversely, and arguably the more important part of this question, is I want to know who some of your least favorite people are to have on and some of your least favorite people are to read or so, or a reporter or journalist that you read that you say, ah, maybe I got to check these facts objectively on my own and not just buy the scoop as it's written. So it's like a seven part question. So I'm going to do my best. To, and so here you go. So in terms of guests that we've had on over the years, um, Tom Rogers has been a guest we've had on over the last couple of years. It is just, and when it comes to media companies is absolutely brilliant. You know, he was basically one of the architects of business news. He's done a lot of amazing things in his career. I, every time he's on, I listen to what he has to say. Michael Burns from Lionsgate came on in basically, I want to say, early 2009, 2010, when they were embroiled in a whole situation with Carl Icahn. And he came on in good times and in bad times. And he's somebody that's been, you know, a real great voice in terms of uh, the media side as well. Dave Barger when he was the CEO of JetBlue, would come on uh, all the time. Again, in good times and bad times, to sort of give us the lay of the land in terms of what was going on in the airline industry. I've always found Mark Cuban to be fascinating. You know, quick anecdote, and I'm not dropping names, but since you asked, I was walking through Inglewood Cliffs uh, many years ago to the makeup room, and this big guy stops me and says, hey, man, I love your show, and I said, Thanks so much. You should buy the Knicks, and it was Mark Cuban, and you know we got we got along really well. We had a really interesting conversation, and you know I'm not saying we're friends, but if I needed something, you know I could text him, "Hey Mark, can you come on the show?" And he's always been quick to answer. So I'll throw him in there. In terms of fun stuff, you know Regis Philbin would come on the show um, pretty regularly. A few years ago, obviously Regis is a little bit older now, but you know he's always been a fun guest. And I'm obviously leaving people out, but those are the ones that come to mind. In terms of reporters that I think do a great job, Mike Santoli obviously does extraordinarily thoughtful work. You know, if you watch him, and he's on a, a lot now during the day. You know, Mike does his homework and really understands. I mean, he's a journalist first, uh, and you know, so when he says something. I'm quick to listen. And in terms of, you know, different sectors, you know, Phil LeBeau does a great job in airlines, and he does a great job in, in autos as well. And, and if I leave people out, it's not because I don't think they do a great job. It's just, it's just omission, and I apologize. Um, in terms of people that sort of twerk me, you know, I'm not going to get – well, and I know you're looking for names, but, you know, a lot of times an advisor will come on – um, and, and they'll paint the, well, I mean, again, the, the, the doesn't have to be disrespectful guy. You can say, Hey, here's somebody I disagree with. That's a respectful way to say you think somebody's full of shit. If you want to drop a name. Well, the Pollyanna ish stuff really starts to, to it wait, you know, it gets on my nerves, you know? So it's the constant, um, you know, the market's strong. The, the, the consumer is strong. You know, the typical nonsense, bullshit, non-helpful answers that you get, you know, when asked a question about a stock, well, a buying opportunity. You know, and you hear that from so many people that it, it really becomes annoying. One of the things that I've said, and I'm not looking to, again, I'm not trying to shirk your, dirk your, or, you know, shirk your question here, but one of the things that I've said on the air a number of times is, you know, you hear everybody come on and talk about, this is a buying opportunity. This is a buying opportunity. When have you ever heard somebody say, well, this is a selling opportunity, right? And the other thing you always hear that really upsets me, and it gets back to one of the original things we talked about 45 minutes an hour ago, is anytime you hear the word selling, the word that precedes it typically is panicked. Right. But right. you never hear the word panicked in front of buying, right. which conditions the viewer or conditions people to believe that anytime something is sold, it's sold in panic. And anytime something is bought, 
It's bought for fundamental reasons. I could tell you that, okay, you want to play the game that, you know, panic selling took us up. Well, the same panic selling that took us up, I mean, maybe we're having a panic buying that is taking us back. And both are, could be deemed irrational. And but you, you could say only, the same thing about... We only look at one. Sorry, you could say the same thing about high-frequency trading and algorithms, how they constantly, constantly, constantly are the scapegoat for the market moving lower, which is very, it's a convenient narrative, right? Because it's a convenient they, narrative, they, but these are the same machines they, that when the, when the market goes higher, exactly. nobody talks about. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And that's, that's frustrating. And that's, those are the types of things that I know people that listen to my podcast and people that follow me on Twitter. Um, and I'm sure many of these cross over to your followers and your listeners as well. I mean, that's the kind of thing that irks the shit out of people. Because, you know, when there's no reason for stocks to move higher, we get poor economic data and then some headline breaks at three o'clock in the afternoon that President Trump went out on the Oval Office and waved to everybody and said the word China and said the word tax cuts and the S&P bids back, you know, 50 handles and, and, and then rallies subsequent to that. Nobody's talking about what the effects of high frequency trading are. Nobody's talking about what the effects of algorithms are. And so it becomes a little bit of a beat narrative. When, you know, we have a market that is arguably incredibly overinflated with an underlying economy that I think we would both agree is at a turning point right now. And as you know, some soon as the market just farts in the wrong direction a little bit and the Dow drops 50 points or 100 points, this conversation about these evil algorithmic overlords comes out of the uh, out of the out of the back room and they, and they get all the blame when they, you know, nobody's yeah. there to defend them or no, say what we're saying. Fair. No, and, and it is fair, and it's something we've addressed and we've talked about. You know, the, the same, these same forces that are working on the downside, the same forces that have worked for you on the upside. So you can't have it both ways, and I happen to agree with that. And what you're learning is, you know, these machines and these algorithms and whatever you want to talk about that take the market up every day, you know, it's one thing to take it up, grind it higher. But, again, markets go down faster than they go up, and, and that's when people get – start to get a little bit <laughs> unnerved. But trust me when I tell you, it's the same forces at work, except those forces work on the downside a lot quicker. I'm sure that makes sense to you. To me, it makes perfect sense. How are you doing on time? You have some more time? I got, an, I, got an, I got to call my son in college in a few minutes, but I got some more time for you sure. You got 15? What do you think? Can you do 15 what, more? Let's, let, whatever you want to talk, we keep going, man. All right. Well, I just got a couple more questions. I keep jotting things down through the midst of our conversation. So the, the I just want to go back real quick, and I want to touch on Phil LeBeau, who you mentioned, and I want to ask you what you thought of his delivery the other day on the news that Tesla's general counsel had resigned, Dane Butswinkis, who was this guy that Tesla – ostensibly brought in because the company was a dorm room and because Elon can't control himself and they needed to have an adult at the company. And several weeks after this guy signed up, he's out the door. You know, the discussion was when he came on board, he's this incredible trial lawyer and he's got such pedigree in the industry and there's no way he would be lending his name to this if he wasn't going to come in and clean the place up. Three, four, five weeks later, the guy's on his way out. Phil LeBeau's on television saying, I think to some degree, you know, we shouldn't worry about this and this shouldn't come as a surprise to people. So two things. One, I'm not sure if you're familiar with his take on it. And if you're not, I'd, I'd like to get your reaction on that. And two, I'd like to just get five minutes on Tesla as a whole uh, from you if, if you'd like to. Yeah, I will. So I didn't see, and I'm again, I'm not dodging. I did not see Phil's delivery on that i obviously take your word that you know that's the way he delivered it again you know i'm not i i, I don't know if it, exactly the the cadence or the or the the words that he used so i don't really want to comment on that but you know if you, if what you're saying is he sort of dismissed it you know i guess that's within his journalistic right i get you know again not having not heard it in terms of tesla it's fascinating, right? I mean, it's an interesting company. I, I said on the show tonight that, you know, in a lot of ways, I think Elon Musk is trying to get out of being the CEO. I think I agree he with finds you. being I think he finds being CEO tedious and and beneath him in terms of the minutia that he has to deal with. And you know, he's a grand thinker that shouldn't be burdened with you know some of the trivial stuff in the, in his mind at least 
that a company is being a publicly traded company. But, you know, guess what? When you take money from the, from the public markets, there's a responsibility exactly. that comes with it. Exactly. And I think he's learning that the hard way. So I happen to think, and maybe I'm 100% off base here, the stock would probably go higher if Tesla announced that Elon Musk was stepping down um, from the role of CEO, they were bringing in whomever they were going to bring in. Elon was going to stay on as chairman or some, you know, in some capacity. I think the market would, would, would be very happy to hear that in this environment. Now, I might be 100% wrong, but I think that's sort of the way Tesla shakes out now. I don't know ego-wise if that's something that he would be amenable to, but I also think that he finds the role of CEO burdensome, uh, to say the least. Yeah, I agree with you. Do you think, I mean, it's been my contention on this podcast that he just doesn't understand what how public reporting works and what his responsibilities are as the CEO of a public company. I think he understands it. I don't think he necessarily um, cares all that much. I'm not, you know, I don't think... I, you know, I think he's he's a maverick in every sense of the word. So I don't think he feels that the rules necessarily apply to him, although the rules do apply to him, whether he likes it or not. And, you know, he shows complete disdain for, you know, the SEC, whether justified or not. He clearly does. So, you know, he fashions himself as I would imagine sort of the Thomas Edison of our time. And maybe he is. But you know what? You got to play by the rules. So whether he appreciates it or not, I mean, that's the road that he decided to take. I, I Karen said this tonight on the show, and I agree with her. Um, I think Tesla is built to be a private company. I think they'd be much better off as a private company. But I don't know if you can put that genie back in the bottle. Yeah, that's a difficult question. How do you go from where they are now with the balance sheet they have now back to a private company? Yeah, and again, I'm sure it's been discussed. Obviously, it was discussed. If you recall, you know, funding secured however many months ago. I do recall. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, so I'm sure those conversations were had. I just don't know if there's somebody out there. You know, somebody out there has to write a pretty significant check, and I'm, I'm I don't know who that group or individual is. All right, so I have two more questions, and I'm going to let you slide. First and foremost. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts quickly. Uh, it doesn't have to be comprehensive, but where do you stand on precious metals? Where do you stand on, you know, gold, for instance? Do you own it? Do you not own it? And so, how do you think it plays I, into the whole picture? So not to bore you further, but I started my career as a gold trader, and for 15 years that's what I did for a living. And so I have a pretty decent understanding of, of the gold market. And I'll, and I'll tell you this about, I think it was about four or so years ago, um, a headline came across that the Bundesbank was looking to repatriate their gold reserves. Right. Uh, Germany had their gold in Paris and in the United States, and we can go into the reasons why, none of which matter, but they woke up one morning and decided they wanted their gold back. There, there's a great line in the movie, The Hunt for Red October, where the late Fred Thompson says to Alec Baldwin that the Russians don't take a shit in the morning without having a plan. And that's true with the Germans <laughs> as well. They didn't just wake up and decided they wanted their gold back. Sure. They clearly saw something going on, and they wanted the metal domiciled back on their borders. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, bear with me for a second. Now, a couple weeks ago, you clearly have seen what's going on with Venezuela, they they called the Bank of England, and I'm you know I'm paraphrasing obviously, but they basically called the Bank of England and said, "Hey, you have 1.2 billion dollars of our gold. We want it back." And the Bank of England said, uh, "No, it ain't going to happen." So, in terms of precious metals, I think what people are learning quickly is, unless you have it, it ain't yours. Does that make sense? And I think what you're seeing now is there are central banks throughout the world that are scrambling to buy the metal and to restock um, their reserve base. And gold has been rallying along with a lot of things that it shouldn't be rallying on the back of. Right. So yep. if you're paying attention, which you are, 
gold is rallying right now in an environment where it probably shouldn't be, and I think that's telling you something. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Um, do you own it? And if so, how do you own it? Do you own miners? Uh, you know, do you own we bullion? Have, we, we have some coins upstairs in the safe and stuff. I think if you're going to own it, if you're going to own now I'm going to sound like a complete nut job, but if you're going to own it, you have to – you have to physically own I agree. The, the metal. I think if you own the paper, if you own the ETF, if, it, if the trade works, the last thing you want to own is the ETF. What you want to own is the actual metal because that's where the price appreciation will be. And again, I don't want to get all wonky with the reasons why, but you know, if the gold trade does work, the, you have to be in the physical metal. Right, because the more, and I said this in May at my uh, presentation at Whitney Tilson's thing, the more things you put in between you and just gold and the spot price of gold, whether it's a management team, whether it's some, you know, peckerhead at iShares that's managing the, you know, the ETF, the more things you kind of put in between you and the commodity itself, the more room for error and the more risk you're taking on, right? I agree. Now, of course, people will say, the naysayers will say, well, the gold trade is basically a trade that if the sun explodes is going to work and if the sun explodes doesn't matter anyway right and i guess i understand that but i don't necessarily think that's the case i think the gold trade is a function of the fact that a lot of people are waking up to central banks globally being um overly accommodative and on one end and reckless on the other yeah, and obviously central banks aren't playing into that narrative if they're scrambling to repatriate their gold, if they're the ones holding they, it in reserve. I think they realize it's funny, right? I think they realize exactly what they're doing in a lot of ways. So in, 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 in a world where everybody's looking to devalue their currency to make their goods more attractive, how does that end well? It doesn't, right? I mean, it doesn't. I mean, we here in the United States outwardly talk about this strong dollar policy but really, if you ask them, if them being the powers that be, what they really want is a weak dollar because a weak dollar makes our goods more attractive. And what a weak dollar does to you and does to me and does to the rest of the citizens is it's a hidden tax. It's an invisible tax because your exactly. buying power gets diminished every day. Nobody wants to talk about it, but that's what's going on, which is one of the reasons why – the Federal Reserve should be raising rates because it'll strengthen our dollar, and although it might hurt our market, it'll increase the buying power of our citizens. And those forces, at some point, will figure the whole thing out. But again, you know, nobody has a political. Clearly, again, nobody has the political will to go down that route. Do you think at some point the populace is just going to figure it out? I mean, I often say that. If the plumber and the welder living next to me in South Philadelphia understood that the cash that they put under the mattress is depreciating 2% every year, or if they understood what you're talking about, you know, the purchasing power of the dollar decreasing, there would be fucking riots. Do you think at some point, regardless of what the Fed narrative is and the government narrative is, the people just start to understand it? If the stock market goes higher basically every day, the answer to your question is no. If you have a market event that opens the eyes of people, then the answer is yes, which is why, in my opinion, the, the Federal Reserve doesn't want a market event. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense to me, brother. There's a couple people I'd like you to run that by on CNBC and elsewhere in the financial media. But I want to tell you one thing, man. I appreciate you so much for coming on the podcast. You know, we've never talked before up until last week when I invited you on the podcast. I'm not sure if you knew who I was or if you didn't know who I was, but not only did you come on the podcast and not only did you sit there while I asked you everything I wanted to, you told me beforehand, ask me anything. I'll talk to you like I talk to anybody else. I think you're dead on balls with 99% of what you said. I have immense, immense respect for you, and I know my listeners will have an immense amount of respect for you. And I just want to say thank you because you have a hell of a lot more to lose from coming on this podcast than I do you know, from having you on because you have gravitas well, I mean, in the industry. If you think about what, you know, we talked, we had an honest conversation about a lot of different things. I mean, I don't think we spoke out of school about anything, and, you know, if you're, this is, I tell my kids this, and I'm sure you've heard it because you probably have the same childhood as I have. 
if you never lie, you never have to remember what you said. Exactly. So, you know, I can, I can sleep pretty well at night, and, and I think you can as well. We need more people like you in the industry, brother. Will you come back on well, soon? Well, you don't want me back on soon, I'm sure, but we'll, we'll definitely have another conversation. I don't want to make I don't want to make the entire viewing audience's eyes glaze over. No, I don't think you're doing that. As a matter of fact, I would argue that you're probably blowing some people's hair back, which is exactly what I like. But I'm going to look you up in a couple months, and uh, and we'll do this again. Sounds good. I appreciate it. Listen, I appreciate your time, and thanks for reaching out. Thanks for being a gentleman. Guy, thank you so much, man. I'll say the same about you. I appreciate it. Take care. Take care. All right, that was the one, the only Guy Adami from CNBC. Fucking class act, man. That guy needs more airtime, and he needs to let it fly on the network because I feel like I agreed with almost everything that came out of his mouth, if not everything. So really a refreshing podcast today, and as I said up front, I owe Guy a debt of gratitude not only for coming on, but also because I gave him shit on Twitter before I really knew where he stood on a lot of these issues that it turns out we're very like-minded on. So awesome surprise podcast today on a Tuesday. Got a lot of things coming on the podcast, but one more time, I do want to thank my patrons like John Cooper, John Ryan Keel, Matt Merle, Craig Gordon, and Ray Cadillac who took the time to submit questions for this interview. I got to a couple of them. I missed a couple of the other ones. But uh, all my patrons had advanced access to know that Guy was coming on and had a chance to submit their questions. So to you guys again, if you want to thank somebody for this kick-ass interview, thank my patrons. For now, it is Tuesday night, and I got shit to do, folks. I am out. Peace!